Hey everyone, it's Zach Dewhurst, Deco Network Business Development Manager. And for today's webinar, we have Nancy Mini, Product Marketing Manager from Madeira USA. How's it going, Nancy? It's going really great. Thank you for having me, Zach. Well, we're everybody I talk to uh, who does any embroidery uh, loves Madeira. Uh, Madeira is essentially the go-to consumable, whether it be thread, backing, needles, um, anything you need for your embroidery jobs, um, Madeira is by far the most popular and uh, very excited to talk about um, the various types of embroidery backing and when to use each one. Um, because in our shop, I, I never really apprenticed an embroiderer or really took any classes. You know, we bought some equipment after outsourcing embroidery for years. Uh, we, we brought it in-house and I made some dumb assumptions that, okay, we, we get it well digitized, we buy good equipment, and we buy a magnetic hooping system, and we're good to go. And it's not that easy. <laughs> There's a lot of variables. <laughs> and, and what I've learned over the past couple of years is you better be using the right backing and also sometimes using uh, topping to get the best uh, embroidery results. So uh, with that said, let's kick off today's webinar and uh, explore again the various types of embroidery backing and topping and when to use each one. So uh, backing is a type of stabilizer. The importance of using a stabilizer. One, durability. We want, if we're going to sew something, we want to make sure it holds up after several washes. Uh, the thread doesn't start breaking down and the design just kind of falls apart. So it's very important to use a stabilizer backing uh, to ensure that that embroidery design uh, holds its durability throughout the life of the product. Secondly, it enhances stitch details. It allows the stitch to really um, be held in place. And Nancy, I'll let you kind of um, explain how, how it enhances the, those stitch details. Sure. Um, so there's a, there's a real nice balance between your top thread and your bottom thread. So tension settings um, for your thread is key in order for the designs to look well. And within that sandwich, when you have the backing underneath there, that gives you a smooth looking design. Um, all the threads lay nice as they're supposed to. Um, so the backing helps hold the, the fabric nice and still while it's being embroidered. So it's been hooped and it's holding it nice and still. So you need that extra backing on the bottom to give a um, good foundation for the designs. I mean, anytime you're doing anything, a good foundation is definitely going to help. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you kind of mentioned this. It, it helps the machine so smoothly, correct? Because can you kind of explain? That's very correct. Yep. Um, so, you know, we're going to get into some details um, as we go along. But one of them is that, you know, some fabrics technically don't need a backing or a stabilizer while it's being embroidered and after the fact because you're going to tear it away but it needs it while you're hooping number one it's going to help you have a nice um, smooth material to embroider on but it's also going to give you the stability during the embroidery and it's going to help that hoop slide along the arm of the machine so you need a plate at the end of your arm you got the backing on the bottom of your hoop you don't have any seams that you're going over that's going to get caught in the arm. Um, it's a nice, smooth surface. Oh, I mean, make makes complete sense why you'd want a smooth surface versus something that's really rough. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and it's very important that you don't just use backing, but you use the correct type and amount. Um, yeah. So if you use too much backing it often will lead to it won't drape well and what what exactly does that mean nancy so i like to go right to the performance wear you know polyester performance wear under armor nike they coined these products but now every apparel company has performance wear and if you haven't seen anybody come in requesting you to embroider on the performance wear um zach it actually looks like you're wearing a shirt that might be performance wear um, and it's embroidered. So that material is very drapey. Um, it hugs every part of your body. 
and that's just part of the benefits of it but other than you know for it to be comfortable um, moisture wick and all that so if you put a hunk too much backing back there it's like this big hunk of backing and it's going to be kind of lumpy underneath the design so the material now is not going to drape the way it should so zach's logo on his left chest um, I'm not seeing any backing there. So a nice thin backing was used. So we don't want to use too much. And, you know, the rule of thumb is, uh, I shouldn't say the rule of thumb, but if you have a three ounce cutaway backing and you th put two pieces of that underneath, now you've got six ounces of backing. The design on pretty much anything is going to look beautiful because you've used so much backing. It's not going to look good behind it is what's going to happen. So that's when you use too much. It does not look good. You get a lot of times you're getting that badge effect as well. So if the shirt Zach is wearing was white or tan, real light, um, those hunks of backing are going to show underneath and you're going to have like this badge or halo around the design. You don't want to see it. Also doesn't so that would be too much. Good, right? Yeah. It, it doesn't feel that great against your skin. It, it won't. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't now, feel good. It won't look good. On the reverse, if you have too little backing, it could compromise the design quality and durability. Um, so can, can you give us a little insight into that? Sure. Um, so on the opposite side, you're using too little backing. Maybe it's a real heavy, high density design and you've used too light of a backing for that. It might look good once you finish embroidering it. It's not going to look so good once you've washed it a few times. So if that backing breaks down, so say if you use a lightweight tearaway on a on where you should be using a cutaway and it goes away and you don't have any backing left, now the design's compromised. It's not going to hold up well um, and it's just going to start wrinkling, potato chipping, um, all those different lingos that are out there. Um, you want your design to look nice and smooth, just like you see on Zach's shirt. Okay. You're, you're, my embroiderer is nodding his head <laughs> over there and he's, he likes the compliments. Okay. So, so you just mentioned a few different types of backing, right? I, it, it's not just, you know, one type fits all and there's just different weights. There's actually different types and, and different thicknesses uh, and weights of backing. So cut away. W w this would be our most common type of backing. I mean, well, not good to say common uh because again it depends on several factors but um when we primarily in our shop we sew a lot of um polos quarter zips um bags that, that that's your go-to cutaway um or products for these uh cutaway backing right absolutely yep so cutaway is definitely the most popular um backing that you want to use and we're going to tell you why when and why you want to use the tearaway but just like you said, anything that's stretchy, um, all the things you described, polos, sweatshirts, t-shirts, your stretchy jackets, um, you need the cutaway because those are stretchy, unstable fabrics. So that's what a cutaway backing is used for. And generally, you know, those are available in the two to three ounce. Yeah. Weight, so. I have like a waffle um, just right, 1.8 ounce. And if I, I th this is a tearaway. Or a cutaway. Is that the right? one? Is that the one point five or one point eight? Is what my package says. Okay, and that's the waffle. Yep. Yep. So that's a tearaway. So that'll be on our next slide. Um, if you have a cutaway and it's doing that, it, it's too light of a cutaway. So there's some one and a half ounces out there um, that they're so light that you can tear them, but they don't tear well. They don't tear clean. They're going to put a lot of pressure on your design when you go to try and tear it away. So a cutaway, you want to stay with the design. Um, like Zach mentioned earlier on in the introduction, it needs to stay with the garment for the life of the garment. So multiple washes, dryers, and things like that. Um, so I do, Zach, have my cutaway section here. Um, so anywhere from uh, two ounce to three ounce, they're basic cutaways. They all look the same for the most part. Um, very, um, it's a non-woven, it's white. There's some blacks available as well for your dark garments. Um, just a simple, basic cutaway um, is what these products are. Yep, and and I'm playing with my um, Madeira swatch book as well. And 
obviously comes in a couple different colors, white and black, um, yep. and different thicknesses. Um, but if, if you have a, you know, if you're going on a polo, if you try to tear it, it should be difficult or it's going to look like yeah. that versus yep. a true cutaway is a clean cut. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, clean tear. Um, so with the cutaways, those fibers are kind of enmeshed to each other, and that's why they don't tear. Where the tearaways are, you can even feel that they're more like a paper. And yeah. that's how these are made. They're made very much like paper is made, where you have fibers that are laid out, you have a binder that goes in there. They're made on these big, huge machines that are 45, 60 inches wide. Um, and that's how they're made, impressed and um, a good quality cutaway backing, if you were to hold it up to the light, you should see the fibers, but they should be consistently across it. If you're seeing a bunch of big open areas, then that quality of that backing is not as good. Because if that light area happens to be in the middle of a big design, now you don't have a good stabilizer inside that design. So a good quality cutaway and tearaway should have consistent fibers and no big holes of gappy gappiness of the fibers but if you buy madeira backing you're always going to have that quality you're going to have good there, quality. there is madeira's backing uh manufactured because you, you kind of just explained how that was done. um we have a combination of domestic and foreign that comes okay. in and Madeira has been selling backing for decades. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. We've been selling it probably right along. I mean, we we're up in our, I think, 45th year here in the United States. Um, Madeira is over hundred years old, you know, Madeira threads. Um, so yes, every product that we bring in um, has to ma match the quality standards that we've set with the thread. You know, the thread is top quality. Um, that's going to run really well with minimal, little to no breaks. Um, and every other product that we bring in has to stand up to those standards. Awesome. All right. So tearaway uh, backing. Again, it, it it's for stable products. Um, sometimes like a heavy jacket, a denim, uh, hats. That's what we primarily use uh, tearaway in our shop because I'm not one who wants to do a full big jacket back. I'll let somebody else do that. We do a lot of hats though. And uh, it's like a bag, a canvas bag, right, Nancy? Yes, a tote, canvas bag, a laundry bag. Um, so to, let's talk about how the mat material's constructed. Um, so these are woven, tightly woven fabrics. Um, so this is what I was talking about earlier where you can say, does do these fabrics really need stabilizer to hold up the design not after it's been embroidered once it's embroidered that tearaway is washed away and it's important to know that all tearaways wash away eventually um, just because you know they're more like the paper they got the um, the rayon in there as well it's going to break down it's going to get softer so you mostly need the backing for that smooth service under your hoop and while hooping to do to create a, a great end piece so you look at your denim your heavy twill your heavy canvas um, those are all tightly woven fabric so that's why you can use a tearaway because those materials are going to hold up just fine once that product's torn away once it's washed a couple times um, the design is still going to look good because the fabric is so stable any tips when actually tear away the uh, backing? You know, if you are you if you do it too quickly, or I mean, what what what's the trick? yeah right? Um, that's a really great question because um, most you know if you're on a denim jacket and what I like to call a clean design, say it's a round circle and it's got a satin stitch all the way around it, right? You're going to tear that away nice and easy because it's got all clean edges. Um, if you have points in your designs, I always pull towards the center of the design. So I let that point kind of tear it away. Um, and then I pull towards the end. If the design's a little bit more delicate, you've got a lot of running decorative stitches. You want to be careful around those because you don't want to pull the thread to the backside. Um, yeah. So some, some tearaways tear away easier than others. Um, there's one that's coming up that I'll say, you know, it's great for delicate designs and um, delicate fabrics because the tear is so easy your basic tearaways 
um, are for those heavy woven fabrics. And the designs you're putting on them typically aren't real delicate. Um, they're nice, hefty designs. Um, so yeah, just be careful. You don't want to pull the threads to the back. Yeah, that we, we've just made that mistake. I mean, it's been a while, but when we were doing some dad hats, you know, that, that, that thinner cotton, and, and if you're too aggressive, um, yep. like you said, you don't want to pull that thread to the back. Right, um, and that's a good point because your your hats, your regular tearaways are like one to, you know, 1.8 ounce for, you know, your jackets, your bags, and things like that. When you go to your caps, we're talking something totally different, and that's where your heavy-duty three-ounce tearaway comes in. Um, so the heavier the backing is, a little more hard to, to tear away, um, but there's actually some some backings that I'll point out that will help with that as well. And, and if you're using multiple layers, is it a good idea to tear one layer at a time versus all of them? Does it matter? I would do one. Yeah, if you're using two layers, especially with your hats, because that's quite common. Um, yeah, just tear one at a time. I mean, if it's a real easy design to tear away, you're pulling two and it's not hurting it. You know, you got to kind of gauge where it is. But I would recommend doing one, one at a time. And what does it take? Half a second? <laughs> <laughs> yep. But don't be lazy. And so actually, that's a really great point is never choose tear away because it's easy. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're talking about why um, and you're going to we're going to learn here today why, you know, you're choosing one over the other. But it's as, as a new embroiderer, why would you use cutaway if I can tear it away? Um, there's a reason why. Yeah. Well, and, and it, there's easy backing for tear away, cut away. I mean, heat away, we're going to go over all of them. It's not just easy, dare away. It's no, all no. the TZ. It's it just is. <laughs> um, so cut away, tear away, wash away. So wash away. So it, it films. It's often a topping a, as well as a backing. Is, is that correct, Nancy? That is correct. And, you know, if you haven't noticed the theme we have going on here is backings basically break down in how they're removed. So we had the cutaway first. So you're going to use scissors to get that away. The tear away, you're going to be tearing it away with your hands. Now we have wash away. So now we're introducing water um, to these products to remove them. Um, so the lighter films are typically used for a topping. To, so on your fluffy material, you want to be sandwiching that those fluff down so you can get a nice design so the thread doesn't sink down in there. Um, if it's a heavier one or like the cutaway fabric, uh, the cutaway um, fabric type stabilizers, those tend to be more of a stabilizer that you embroider directly on or put on the back of something. I mean, you can just see I've got a pack of the Easy uh, Aqua Supreme and yeah. it's, it's very flimsy. What I find interesting, Nancy, is this is 250 uh, pieces. <laughs> this is 250 pieces. I mean, exactly. it, it, it's, um, although this is more expensive, but once we started using uh, the Aqua Supreme, um, especially, you know, when we like to, we love using it on really thin poly or like a knit, like beanies. We, we have found that it really helps stabilize um you know fine detail or again on those looser uh fabrics um yes. so again like knits thin polos um high profile fabrics like fleece or freestanding lace can, can you kind of explain freestanding lace yes um so um, freestanding lace is what you'd use at cutaway wash away fabric type stabilizer. Freestanding lace is when you have a design that's been digitized specific um, so that when you embroider the design on the fabric, wash away fabric, um, the all you're left with is thread at the end. Um, so if you think of a lace doily um, or, you know, there's all kinds, I mean, there's angels out there. There's ornaments are very popular right now this time of year. Um, and it's so beautiful to see the backing go away and just be left with the thread. Um, so it's an all thread product and um, it, it lace is what it kind of looks like. And, and you often see done. this um, with like a towel. Is that a good time to be using wash away backing? You could use a wash away backing, definitely. Um, so if it's a terry towel, you'd put that um, Aqua Supreme on the very top 
if it's a nice clean design that you can get rid of on the or you want to get rid of it on the back as well you could put the um, the cutaway wash away fabric on the back for your stabilizer it all washes away it perforates um, one of them perforates the other ones you have to cut away um, but everything's gone in the end um, some people do you know I've seen cutaways regular cutaways used on the back of towels um, but typically towels are pretty heavy duty and they can support the design pretty well after the backing has gone. Awesome. All right. And then <laughs> our last of the four types of backing is heat away backing. And I'll be honest, I've never done, I've never used heat away backing, um, which is often used for badges, patches, emblems. And the reason why I've never uh, used it is we never sew badges, patches, or emblems. Um, I've done a lot of consulting with shops who do. Um, it's just not our uh, niche or what we've gone after. But um, patches are very popular, um, obviously. And, and, you know, badges, if you work with um, maybe a police station, they're, they're, it's a badge. Um, yep. So can you tell, give us a little insight of how heat away backing works? Sure. Um, so mostly it is used for patches. The other thing that it can be used for is um, there's, there's a lightweight version and a heavyweight. The heavyweight tends to be more for the badges, and I'll explain that a little bit. Um, but I want to start with the lightweight first. It's really, it, the lightweight is what would be called a heat away topping or a heat away stabilizer. Um, so it can be used much the same as like easy aqua topping on your towels, your fleece and things like that to keep the thread from sinking. It could also be used on the bottom as a um, stabilizer. Um, so maybe you're embroidering on something you don't want to be soaking in water, um, but it can handle a little heat. So it perforates and you tear it away. Um, anything that's left in the middle of like, say the letter O, um, you can add a little heat and it's going to kind of just melt it away. So the and, heat and makes it removed. When it comes to that heat, should we use a heat press? Should we use a heat gun? What, what's the trick there? Um, I think the best thing is a heat gun. You could probably use an iron or a, a press. You just have to, you know, you don't go directly on it. Um, you just need to get the heat near it. Um, and then it, what it basically does is it kind of shrinks up and becomes little balls that you can just brush away. Okay. Um, so going back to the thicker one for the heat, um, for the badges, patches, and emblems, um, this material is 100 microns thick. So you can hoop it um, either one layer or two layers. You can embroider directly onto the fabric to create an entire badge um, out of any shape, any size. Um, well, it's 19 inches wide, so you can go quite big. Um, the biggest thing I have embroidered on was a 12-inch superhero. Um, look like a, a, a Superman type superhero, um, but it was 12 inches high um, and embroidered on two layers of this. And it, what happens with these designs is they're digitized specifically. They do the satin stitch on the very end, gives you that edge, like that marrow edge of a patch and it perforates out anything that's left, little pieces here and there, you can just apply the heat and it'll kind of shrink up and go away. And you can do this two ways. You can either embroider directly on two layers, all thread, create a badge, or you could introduce some twill, your blank twill patches. And then you would use an applique type technique to attach that blank patch and then do the design. And again, the last thing you want to do is that satin outer stitch so that it's ready to be perforated. And then you're left with a beautiful patch. Um, if you, anybody, you know, this, this fabric's been around for a few years, um, but in order to do patches in the past, like 20 years ago, you had to use the big frames, the, the layers of fabric backing. You'd cut them out either by hand or you'd use your die cuts. Then you'd have to have a separate machine to do your marrow edge um, to create badges. And your big patch companies are going to do that. You know, that's how they still do it. Um, but this gives you a great opportunity to do, whether it's 1, 10, 24, um, you can offer your customers and no longer send those out to someone else. And and you, you brought up a great point, um, as in, it, it, 
embroidery has a lot of variables, just like screen printing, just like DTF, DTG, every process, you know, any, any decoration method uh, essentially has a series of variables to get right. Uh, using the correct one of these four backing is, is only part of it. Um, you can use the correct backing, but if it wasn't digitized correctly um, for the material it's being sewn on, it, it, it's not going to sew as well. If you're not using the right size needle, it's not going to sew well. If you don't properly hoop it, it it's not going to sew as well. So, um, you know, backing is just part of the, um, you know, mix of variables to get right to deliver the best possible results. Oh, and then look, variables that determine the type of backing. So again, how do we choose which backing type between those four uh, for a design? So one, the fabric construction. So can you tell us a little bit more about that, Nancy? Yes, of course. Uh, so I want to go back to just back up a little bit to, you know, if you're doing screen printing, you're very often you want to know what the product is made of is it cotton is a polyester is it a blend is it wool or anything like that because that's how you determine which inks to use correct? correct when it comes to embroidery it's how it's constructed so is it knit is it woven is it lightweight woven or is it heavyweight woven so the first variable that you have to look at is how was that how is that fabric constructed? And we're going to have a chart that really shows how to determine, you know, what's a knit and what's a, what's a woven. Okay. And, and, um, so cutaway, tear away specialty, and then the design itself, how does the design influence the weight of the backing? There you go. Um, so the second, variable that we're going to talk about in choosing and keep in mind these two variables are the basics of choosing your backing so why do we have a one ounce cutaway uh tear away why do we have a 1.8 ounce tear away um why do we have light medium and heavy that's so that when you look at the design you're putting on that garment is it a huge design with lots of density lots of stitches you're most likely going to go with the heavier backing. If it's a lightweight, airy, open airy design, you're going to go with a lighter backing because you don't need that much. It's not necessarily how many stitches are in the design. It's often the stitch density. Is, is that fair, Nancy? Yes, that's very fair. And we're going to have some images that show the same size design, you know, with one might have 22,000 stitches. The other one has... 40,000 stitches. So it's how many stitches we're putting per say square inch or, you know, how in the same area, how many stitches are we putting there? Is there a lot of density? Is there a lot of fills? Is there a lot of running stitches? Um, um, so that's where the design itself becomes a factor or a variable. Okay. So let's dive into that. So the fabric construction, um, so cut away, uh, like you said, uh, knit fabrics, like t-shirts, sweatshirts, polos, um, and then your, uh, lightweight, loosely woven fabrics, linen, dress shirts, fashion, uh, scarves. And, and can you kind of explain the two images we're, we're seeing here? Absolutely. Um, so these are what we would consider unstable, um, typically have a little bit of a stretch or a lot of stretch to them. So the knit fabric that you're seeing in the graphic is one thread intertwines in itself. You know, you cut one of those threads, the next thing you know, you have a big hole in it. Um, so it's very important. And it's also stretches in all the different, you know, directions as well. Um, the lightweight or loosely woven, and now you're going to talk about maybe a dress shirt, um, scarfs, anything that's very light. So we're not talking about canvas or denim that's going to come next. We're talking about real lightweight woven. So you have some threads going horizontal. Some of the threads in there are woven just um, going vertical. And those are um, intertwined just like a basket would be uh, woven. So okay. these are both 
unstable fabrics, meaning they need a lot of stability while you embroider on it. Meaning they need a cutaway Absolutely. versus a heavier, tightly woven fabric is going to be using more of that tear away. And again, like we keep saying, denim, the caps that a twill and, and canvas bags. And, and it looks like it's, again, when you say tighter and you look at the two, you look at this versus this, it's obvious that they're, they're tighter. There's a lot closer uh, stitches together, right? Yes. Yep. Um, so the one under the cutaway, you can see all the open areas. So that would be an enlarged version of, say, a dress shirt, um, whereas the one on the right, the um, tightly woven fabric, that's like a blown up picture of canvas. Um, so if you hold a Carhartt jacket versus a um, the soft shell jacket, you know, one is heavier. You can just feel it. You can see it. Um, now that's where that fabric can support itself. It can support the design once it's been embroidered. Um, so that's why I use the tearaway. Remember all tearaways wash away. Um, so if you want that back and to stay, you use a cutaway. Again, don't, don't just make what's easy and what, what washes away versus doesn't. It, it's very important that it yep. um, holds up in the wash. That's right. Um, and then, again, going back to the design. So if we have a higher stitch count uh, density, so if we're looking at this example of the lion's mane, um, looks very dense. We want to use a heavier weight backing, correct? That is correct. Yep. So we have, this is about six by seven inches and we have 42,000 stitches in there. Um, to add to that, we're using a thicker thread. If this was a 40 weight thread, uh, there would probably be more like 80,000 stitches in this size design. Um, this happens to be a Burmalana, uh, which is a 12 weight thread. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the next design that comes in is going to show you the opposite where it's very open. It's airy, so little uh, about the same inch wide, but we have now we have 12 inches high. But look, we've cut those stitches in half. Um, so you know, if you're talking about a left chest logo, um, I like to say you know 30,000 stitches is a pretty decent size stitch to put up there. Um, but that's going to be a lot more dense. But if you look at the owl, um, he's bigger than the owl, but it has way less stitches. So he's got a lot of decorative running stitches. Um, so you could use a lighter weight backing cutaway if it's on an unstable fabric, a tearaway if it's on a stable fabric. Okay. I mean, it, it makes sense. You know, the, how that fabric is constructed will determine tearaway versus cutaway and then the design itself, um, and how, um, dense the stitches are going to be then determines what weight we should use, whether it be tear or you got it. So what is and why use topping? We've been primarily talking about backing. Um, so explain to us what exactly topping is and why we use it. So topping is, um, what Zach was holding up earlier, our easy aqua supreme it is a water soluble topping. It's about, it's a 20, 20 micron. It's a 20 micron. Thank you. Um, very thin, um, backing a little bit of water. You know, you have to actually keep this in your bag to keep the air away from it, any moisture in the air, um, because it's so susceptible to, um, water. It just turns into liquid and goes away. Um, so this particular design was embroidered on a fleece scarf. Um, one was with, one was without, one was with topping on the left, the other one without on the right. And if you look at specifically the little red heart kind of right to the side, the right side there, and look at that side by side, you can see yeah. because it's mostly just running stitches that got lost in a fluffy fleece um, scarf. So because we put the topping on, it sandwiched that fleece down, it lays it flat and it kind of traps all those fibers underneath the thread where it doesn't sink down. So the thread's sitting on top instead of sinking down into those fluff. And, and in, again, in our shop, we love using the topping when we're on something very thin or we have very, um, very small text. We have found that it can really help um, hold that detail 
uh, when it, when it's being sewn instead of it like, really does thinking into that fabric. <laughs> um, and again, that you can use the right needle size, but again, it it it's really going to help to having that topping and uh, stabilizing. Um, and you would it is considered still a stabilizer, right, Nancy? Um, it, you know, for aqua topping, technically, I mean, it's a stabilizer for the top for sure. Um, you know, and it's funny, we, why do we call it backing? Why do we call it stabilizer? They're really the same thing. Um, I like to say backing is where it goes. Stabilizing is what it does. Um, yeah. but whether it's a topping or a backing, um, it's, it's doing the same thing. It's stabilizing that fabric, um, while it's being embroidered and even beyond you know, once it's worn, washed and laundered several times. Um, so people do ask, is it going to come out? Um, typically it has, it has sandwiched those um, fibers down in between. So it's really important when you go to tear this away, you're going to be really careful tearing it away. Don't pull hard on it. Um, and don't be trying to go in there with tweezers, trying to get all those little pieces out. It's important that you want to spray it, spritz it with steam. <clears throat> um, and spritz that extra piece of the leftover, and then you dab it to remove those pieces. Um, and if you can throw it in the laundry, all the better. Better it doesn't get um doesn't get lost. I'm gonna grab a lozenger because I can tell I'm losing my voice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like <clears throat> Nancy just said, um, the Aqua Supreme is it again. It's a it it's a it's water soluble, but you first initially tear it and then you throw water on it, right? You don't just try to start cutting it. Um, nope. Yep. Absolutely. Water or steam. I tend not to turn the steam on just because it's easier to spray. And then I just lay it out and let it dry. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, very important when it comes to introducing water to your embroidery is that you lay it out to dry. You never stack your embroidery on top of each other. Um, every once in a while, we have an embroiderer who has blue thread, royal royal blue is very common, that you, if you, first time you introduce water to it, it starts to bleed out. And it's, there's nothing wrong with the thread. It's typical in that every time, all thread, almost all thread has a little bit of over dye in it. The first time it's laundered, washes out, it's gone. Nobody ever sees it, right? But when you do introduce water, you have to be very careful to make sure it air dries and never stack them on top of each other. It's kind of like heat pressing a red shirt. First time you do it, you're like, whoa, what happened? Get, just give it a little bit of time. It, it's going to come right back to that same color. Right, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's certain colors that that happens to more often, for sure. All right. <clears throat> Now, Madeira, uh, pretty much all of the backing and topping, it is easy, right? <laughs> no that is a perfect thing for it, right? It's like we thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so easy backing topping is the Madeira backings. Um, like I said earlier, they were chosen um, because of their quality um, so that we could offer the same quality for your top thread and your backing that goes on there. Um, so I think what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about um, the different ones that we have available and yep. um, take it from there. And again, if you ever go to a trade show, definitely stop by the Madeira booth because they they have this uh, easy backing and topping um, packet. And it comes with all these different uh, samples of the different types. And it's amazing, you know, just holding them up and and feeling them you can definitely see uh, well common sense will tell you well what's one and a half going to feel versus three I mean, it's a big difference um and again it's not just about choosing the right type it's also about choosing the right weight of backing right. uh, to get the best results yep. so and then we're, i'm sorry ahead. then when we get into the specialty ones we're gonna you know why do we have so many um and it's gonna we're gonna explain that to you as we go along oh. It can be it could be a little uh, overwhelming initially to know which which one to to, to grab, yeah. um, but the easy cut away it, hefty two ounce so it's for um, medium weight 
um, or, or it is a medium weight, uh, commonly used for knits and loosely woven fabrics, uh, small to medium sized designs. Uh, is this kind of a go-to uh, backing for most shops? Um, yeah, absolutely. So a two ounce, it's it, nowadays it's leaning on to this is our probably lightest weight. The one and a half ounce is actually not available anymore. So two ounces now become our lightest weight uh, because the one and a half ounce was just too lightweight um, and wasn't given the stability that it needed to. Um, so this would be a very common size that you would keep in your, your shop to have on hand. Um, so that knits and loosely woven fabrics, that's going to be true for all of our cutaway backings that we're talking about here. So now we're talking, now you want to look at, you know, what, when would I choose this? Well, I'm not going to choose it for an 80,000 stitch design. I'm going to choose it for a 20 or 30,000 stitch or something larger that has less stitches in it. I, th that's still a lot of stitches, 20,000 stitches. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> Okay, so so and again, I, I as I feel it, you know what's interesting, Nancy, is this one and a half versus two. I mean, you can really tell a difference between those two uh, yeah. more than you can tell like the two to two and a half ounce. So common kind of common sense to me why that kind of was was faded away. Um, so easy cut just right, two point five ounce. So superior stability. Uh, often again used for medium sized designs, knits and loosely woven fabrics. So um, tell us a little bit about the two and a five, two and a half ounce. Right. So two and a half ounce is now probably your medium, your medium weight. Um, and it's when we first brought this one in, it was called just right for a reason because it really was that middle of the ground um, weight that's great for, you know, a lot of all around embroidery your left chest logos, um, um, any of your other designs that you're doing as well that aren't too big, you know. Yeah, you can use two layers of it, but now you have five ounces. Do you really want five ounces of backing? Probably not. No. Um, three ounces is your heaviest, and that's probably the heaviest you really want to go. If you, you might need to now go, if it's not working on a three ounce, and it should, now you got to look at your other variables. You should be looking at the design, the digitizing. Is it top quality? Is it is it done for the fabric that you're embroidering on? Um, so yes, and um, two and a half is kind of the middle of the road. Is it common to be doubling up? You know, like the just right. So <laughs> if I do two layers, now I'm at five ounces. Is that common versus, you know, I know the one and a half is being phased away, but one and a half times two equals three versus using a three ounce. So right. um, yeah. what are your thoughts there, Nancy? Um, I find it's pretty common that people use two layers of backing to compensate um, for, you know, maybe it's a poor quality shirt or maybe the digitizing is not as good as it could be. So I, I find it quite often that as a regular rule, people use two layers. And and is it a good idea, you know, if I have two layers that I actually rotate one a little bit so that they're they're kind of coming at different angles to create a true, I don't know, a tighter weave? Um, yep. If you want, sorry, hold on just a minute. It's that time of year, Nancy. My throat I know. Is... Everything's no. so dry, so I'm sorry. So dry. Um, so what you're doing is you're putting them at a 45 degree angle. And if you're, we're talking about a basic back away, that's what's called a non-woven. So there's no threads going up and down or side to side. There's not like a, like a knit that has one piece. When you're doing that, if you're adding any extra stability, it's pretty minimal because they are non-directional. Um, so sometimes I find if you're doing that and you do put it at the 45, you're getting a little bit more coverage in the hooping by doing that. So I find it helps with the hooping. It's not really going to add much more stability unless you're going to a woven backing. And we're going to talk about those in a little bit. And, and just cause you brought it up, Nancy, uh, when it comes to hooping, it, nothing beats a magnetic hoop in my opinion. <laughs> Um, I love the Mighty Hoop um, system and then the Hoop Master. 
um, I can never keep them straight. Which one's which? One of them is the board and, and that technology, and the other one is the magnet. But I love Hoopmaster and um, the Mighty Hoop. It, it makes hooping so much easier. It's a lot easier to keep the backing in place as you're um, connecting it, you know, with, when you're hooping that uh, material. Uh, Absolutely. Magnetic hoops are, you know, they're, they're very, they're changing. Uh, they change the way you hoop. And once you try one, you're going to want them all um, oh, for God. sure, because they really do just this, the whole system together makes it so much easier to hoop um, for sure. Absolutely. Um, and then we have, so you have the just right two and a half ounce, then you have the Supreme, um, which has a softer hand. So uh, going, you know, talking about printing, whenever we talk about the hand, it's the feel. Um, so the Supreme, does that mean it's going to have a better feel um, on the inside? Again, you know, if it's going to be touching your body, is, is that the concept, Nancy? Yep. Um, so the softer feel or the softer hand to this might not be as apparent by feel when you take one piece of backing and feel it next to the other. When this comes in, this comes into play more so when it's been washed. So it has a much softer feel to it. And some of your cutaway backings, um, depending on what you wash it with, you get that those little balls. So it's called pilling. Um, and then you look at the back of your back, uh, your design, and you see the backing, and it's it's got little fuzzinesses over it. Um, if it has the name Supreme like this in the backing, um, it goes through a, pre a special process um, that actually makes it feel like it's a little thinner. So this one, if you feel it next to the other two and a half just right, feels a little bit thinner. If you put two packs next to each other, one's going to be thicker, and this is going to be thinner, um, just because of the process that it's gone. So a two and a half ounce, one ounce, three ounce, whatever, um, we're, that, we're talking about per square, square yard. Um, that's how much the product weighs. So whether we're looking at the easy cut two and a half ounce just right or the two and a half ounce Supreme, they both weigh two and a half ounces per square yard. So they're given the same stability. The Supreme gives a little bit more um, better look after it's been laundered. Yep, and, and that the, um, the the weight makes complete sense to me um, because you know I learned years ago that a t-shirt, when you hear that this is a 4.5 um, ounce versus a 3.0 or 6.1, like what, what does that mean? Well, yep. it's a square yard of fabric and, and the weight of it. Um, and this Easy Supreme is often, again, used with medium stitch counts and density designs. Um, and it'll have little to no lint build up after wash, washing, just like you said, Nancy. Exactly. Okay. Then we have the three ounce. So, again, we just keep getting heavier. Um, and the three ounce, you can tell. I mean, it's, it's definitely heavier. Um, for higher stitch counts and density design. So if we go back to like that lion uh, design that we showed a few slides earlier, very dense, a lot of stitches and a small amount of area, we wanna be using something like this hefty um, to really stabilize versus if we had a lot of open stitches, we'd be using uh, more of that two ounce, right? There you go, perfectly said. Um, so examples would be maybe you're doing a full front sweatshirt um, this three ounce is going to be great for that. So um, nice, you know, I don't know, eight inch by eight inch, filling that right in. Um, that three ounce works great for that. A lot of people do use three ounce on a regular basis. And, you know, it's just like with anything. If it's not broke, don't fix it. If the three ounce is working for you um, on a regular basis, then keep going with it. Um, it's really only when it comes to those performance sh shirts, um, lightweight, um, dress shirts and things like that is when you're going to run into trouble. Um, but a lot of people, a three ounce is a go-to. And we have a few options here and they're pretty much, you know, very similar um, <clears throat> to them. Um, we've got the the just right three ounce up there on the screen and the, the regular super hefty. That's more like that Supreme one we talked about. So there's little to no lint buildup after it's been laundered. Um, and, you know, we find with embroiderers, you know, if we only have one version and they don't like it, 
chances are they're going to like the other one. So we have a couple options out there and, you know, embroiderers are very touchy feely uh, when it comes to, you know, choosing things and, you know, what, what makes them decide to go with one or the other. Um, so if they don't like one, you know, they, they technically have two more options than the three ounce because um, we're going to see coming up a three and a half ounce. So um, we're happy to send samples to people. If you want to try them out, we have our sample books. Um, we're going to be at Long Beach um, coming up in January of 2024. I'm sure going on through the years, we're usually there um, at the Impressions show. So those books that you're seeing, you know, we have usually have those at the show. Um, but if you're looking for one, you can ask for one of those as well. Nancy, you just you, you kind of mentioned something, and I meant to uh, mention it earlier. Actually, a couple things to mention. One, if you have <laughs> questions, please submit them, and we will be going over them at the end. But Nancy, you, you you mentioned, and I've kind of held up, um, backing can be purchased essentially in pre-cut squares, or it can be purchased as a big roll. Um, I love the squares because it's just so simple and easy to grab. Um, and typically, there's a couple different sizes, correct me wrong, um, seven and a half by eight. So most of the time they're right around that size, which again, just works perfect when you're hooping um, those left chest designs, which, which are very common versus the the rolls absolutely could be used for those left chests. But do you see those rolls often used for, again, bigger embroidery designs? Um, maybe it's a little bit cheaper to go with the roll, but you then got to cut it. Wait, what's the logic behind that, Nancy? And it, or, or was everything used to be a roll and now the cut squares have become real popular? Can you give us a little insight? Uh, as to oh, well, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I've been in the industry for 23 years and they've had both for 23 years. Um, I find that if we bring in a new backing, typically it's with the rolls and a one, back, a one, one pre-cut to start out with. Um, but I, I think the bigger your shop is, the more efficient you need to be to make your money or, you you know, get a great margin is you're going to go with those pre-cuts because it's very easy. Um, and like you said, Zach, eight, eight by eight, seven and a half by eight, that's kind of your typical pre-cut size that you're always going to be using. Um, if you're using your round tubular hoops, you have a really tiny one. Um, so, you know, for a real small logo, you would use the six by six or six, six and a half by six. Yep. Up on your, your shirt um, sleeve. Um, so again, it, it's going to depend on the embroiderer. Um, jacket backs, um, sweatshirt, full front. We're not seeing as much of that right now. I, I don't think, um, but absolutely. That's what you're going to need your rolls for. There are some pre-cuts that are quite large, you know, 14 by 15, 15 by 15, um, and you could use those for your jacket backs as well. So I think it really depends on, you know, your shop and what your needs are. But pre-cuts, definitely more popular. Okay. Um, like I said, heavy fleece, knit, stretchy fabrics, um, often used with the three ounce. But again, it's the design that's dictating the weight. Correct. And yep. so our cutaways are for our unstable, stretchy fabric. That, so why do we go from a three to a 3.1 ounce, the super uh, hefty plus, you know, why, yeah. why do we have that versus just a typical three? It's really just another option of your heavyweight. Um, a 0.1 ounce really makes very little difference, um, but it's just another option. And ironically, um, the way that this product is manufactured, it's our thinnest yeah, I was about to bring that up, Nancy. Sorry for interrupting, but I'm looking at it like, whoa, this is definitely thinner than the three ounce. Yep. So that goes back to the hand, which would mean this one feel that this one will feel a little stiffer um, because it's compressed more. So it's still weighing three ounce per square yard, 3.1, um, but it's a little more compressed. So again, um, embroiderers, some people like this, some people like a fluffier one. Okay. And, and what I'm also seeing again, it, it like Madeira makes it very easy. I, 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 I grabbed one of these, um, halfway through last year. And, um, like a lot of things at a trade show, you, you 
grabbing all these free samples and literature and then I throw it in my book bag and then I forget to actually really look at it and and Madeira breaks it down so well um and and one thing I see here is um pretty much the two the two and a half and the three ounce super heavy can or have hef tea sorry um are available in both white and black right yes um yep. so if i'm going on a black polo very common uh, black's very common obviously <laughs> i often we use the black when we go on sure. a white or a you know that dress shirt we go with white i mean that's that's yeah. essentially kind of the well and then like for colors we we've never really seen that big of a difference i mean is is, is it that important or is it more of uh we often use white on lighter dark on dark but what, what, what's what yeah it, again so we're going to go back to the embroider and what they really like could you use white on the on the black polo absolutely are you going to see it probably not right um you wouldn't do vice versa you wouldn't use a black on a white shirt um so black would be, be considered a specialty backing okay. um because and it really comes down to you know maybe it's a jacket back and it's a dark black jacket or a dark denim putting that black cutaway, if that's what needs to be there, not on denim, uh, but maybe a soft shell, um, makes it a little less visible. So it's a jacket, you throw it over the chair, now you see in the back of the embroidery, that black looks a little better on the dark. Um, or maybe, you know, you consider yourself a very high-end um, producer, product producer, and you really want to have that, go that extra step to have a dark backing back there so it's not visible. Um, most times you don't need black. Um, you could use the white. It's a little bit more expensive. Is that correct? Typically the black it is. is yeah. The white. Yep. Um, it's, yeah, it's a decent markup on that because it is a lesser produced, you know, it's not as mass produced as your white ones are. Hear that Garth? We're, we're, we're spending more money than we probably need to sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing about backings is, you know, you talked about 250 pieces in there. When you break down that product by piece, it's minimal, right? It's minimal. It's, it, you're not really pinching pennies. I mean, when I when you look at embroidery, I, the the consumables, um, again, the thread, the backing, I guess you could call kind of a needle's kind of a consumable because uh, you're replacing them all the time that yeah. they're not that expensive. The machine is expensive and the time uh, that it's running um, and Absolutely. it's skilled labor. You know, it's not just, you, you can't just grab somebody off the street and say, hey, you're, you're now embroidering and, and tomorrow they're gonna be putting out great stuff. It is a trade skill. Um, and yeah, you, 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 when, it's, when it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, like, like you keep saying, Nancy. Um, right. So our easy cut, super hefty plus just right. Again, heavyweight, knits and loosely woven fabrics, high density designs. Uh, it is a little thinner uh, than, than the three ounce, um, which again, if you, you actually physically see and feel it. Um, and you said that the 3.1 would be a little bit better hand. What was that what you said, Nancy? Um, so it's a little thinner because it's compressed. Um, so, so if you're asking. looking to lighten up the bulk behind there, that will do it. Okay. Um, so that's kind of it for the, um, or not it, but then we have the easy cut wash away. Um, yes. so easy cut wash away starting at the 1.2 ounce. Now that's pretty thin, Nancy. Um, it is. I'm going to hold mine up here to the camera and you can see it's very fibrous. Um, and this, if I were to put a drop of water right there, it would leave a little hole. Um, this is very susceptible, just like the water soluble um, topping. This um, is activated best with a uh, warm water. So that freestanding lace, if you embroider that on here, um, you'd put it into a little or run it under hot water, put it in a bowl of warm water. Um, it just dissipates and just goes away. Um, so that could be good for your towels, um, your freestanding lace, your heirloom embroidery, and your cutwork embroidery. Um, this is a great product that if you can introduce the water, it goes away completely. Wow. So again, I like it. to use two layers if I'm doing 
freestanding. I, I would think maybe one for a small, but two for larger stitch counts. Yeah. Um, removes with warm water. Uh, definitely very thin. That, that's obvious. It is. Yep. Um, this is very often referred to as Vilene. It's the same product as Vilene. Versus the 1.9 ounce. I mean, it's substantially thicker. Yeah, um, it's actually the same product with an adhesive. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to see if I can rip it apart here, just a little. And it has this release paper that comes off. And what's left is the same exact product. On one side, it's all sticky. Yeah. So you release it um, from there. So it, it is the same product, feels a little heavier because the adhesive is on there. Um, and this is when, say, if you needed to hoop. I don't know, a really stretchy bathing suit, bicycle shorts. Um, you could actually stretch the material on it because when you're embroidering on something that stretches when you wear it, you actually have to stretch it before you embroider it. When it's done embroidered, kind of puckers in, doesn't look great until you put it on the body and it stretches out. So the adhesive helps hold that stretch when you need it. Um, or maybe you're embroidering on a real lightweight delicate fabric and you need a little more stability, but you want it to wash away, you could use something um, like this as well for that. So right before you embroider, you separate the two and you get rid of the um, paper. Paper. Um, yeah. So it's really just 1.2 ounce with adhesive. Right? That's yes. really it. I mean, we just call it 1.9 because it's 1.9 with the paper. Uh, That's right. Really and the glue. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And yep, like you said, slippery, unstable <laughs> fabric. Um, great point that you just made there. If the fabric stretches, like I said, maybe a bathing suit, you want to stretch it and sew it like that uh, versus having it not stretched. And then when it is worn and it's stretched, it, it's, it doesn't look right. You're going to have all these holes and it's going to fight. Makes sense. Okay. And now let's talk about tearaway. Um, so, well, we're going to start with one and one ounce to 1.5 ounce. And, and you know, like right now I'm holding up this uh, cap um, tearaway. This is three ounces. So if I were to use this versus again, we kind of mentioned it versus three one ounce or two one and a half ounce, I will get roughly the exact same results. Is that fair or is it better to use less um, if possible? Um, and it's a very fair statement to say that. However, if you can use one layer, you're better off introducing one layer to the as a variable as opposed to two layers. So during the hooping process, during the embroidery process, having less layers moving is better. Um, but during that hooping process, if you can get it nice and snug, very common. So you were, what you were holding up were the um, cap backing. So the very thin four, four and a half inches wide um, has that nice 270 degree width that you can do the front and the sides at the same time. Um, but if you go to the lighter weight ones, those are more for your garments. And that heavyweight tearaway is almost always used for cap. And caps are an animal of their own when it comes <laughs> to embroidery, right? Um, because yeah. your, your machine loves to embroider on your flat tubular hoops. Um, flat hoop, nice and flat. Great. You start hooping on a round frame. Now you've got floating and, you know, extra backing is one of the ways that you help tame that hat and keep it from bouncing. So that nice heavy weight is a perfect choice. I, I like your choice of word of taming the hat. <laughs> taming the hat, yeah. Uh, so we have a couple different ounces here. If we start with that one ounce, it's very lightweight. Um, it's going to have minimal stability. I very often use it with the Weblon or the Polymash that we're going to talk about in a few slides coming on those performance wares. Um, yep, so yep. Sorry, Nancy, but yeah, we we something that you kind of just mentioned there and I just want to point out, um, we have found a lot of success by mixing, I don't want to say just mix and match, but but taking a couple different types of backing and, and doubling them up to, to get the best results. So if you say like easy Weblon no-show or easy poly mesh, um, 
I assume it is important which layer is on top versus the bottom. It, it, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if you're putting a cutaway and a tearaway together, the tearaway always goes on the bottom so that you can tear it away first and then you can trim away your back. And you don't want that tearaway sandwiched inside your cutaway. Um, so if there's parts of the design that you can't get to, you want to be able to tear it away. So always on the bottom, your cutaway goes next to the skin um, so that that's what's left and you're feeling next to the skin for sure. So um, we'll get into that a little bit, I think, once we get to the web, uh, the performance wear backings coming up and, and why we do that. So, so tearaways, remember, are for your real stable fabrics, your canvas, your twill, your denim. Um, and then we choose the weight based on the design itself. So, and, and so we go from a one ounce to a um, one and a half ounce. Um, 1.8 ounce. And it, and I mean, it feels like it's just like the, the math says, you know, 50% thicker um, yep. or heavier. Um, yeah. 1.8 ounce, that's barely a difference. What, um, but weight-wise, Weight-wise it is, but when you actually start looking at it, it's like, whoa, this does look a little different. Um, yep. So why would I, when would I use a 1.8 ounce versus that 1.5? So maybe you're doing a big, a large design with a lot of stitches on a bag um, or the back of a jacket. Um, that's real stable fabrics, you know, one and a half ounce. And there's even a soft um, two ounce available. So it was a little bit heavier. Um, so bigger designs, um, heavier density, use your higher weight. So, and so you go the opposite light designs for your lighter weight tearaways. So notice we, we have crisp here, um, and then now we're onto the soft stabilizers. So you may have felt the different stabilizers. They both tear and tear well. Um, a crisp one will leave minimal left around the edges, where a soft tearaway is going to leave little fuzzies around the edge. So if it's a circle design, and it's got a satin stitch around it, you're going to see all these little fuzziness around it. And it has less stress on the design with a soft tearaway. Um, and that's why, you know, if, if you don't want it to stress the design or fabric, then you might want to switch over to a soft tearaway. And, and what we have found, it's not like backing uh, expires overnight, right? Um, mm -hmm. You can have a variety of backing in your shop, use the appropriate one. Um, but what, what is the best way to store backing? You know, if, if I have it in a really low humidity environment or a high humidity environment, am I going to shrink the shelf life? Does it matter? Um, but what, what's right. the strategy That's a there? great question. Um, and I think for all embroidery supplies, because this applies to your thread even more so, um, having a, a Air, air controlled environment where you're minimizing your heat and your humidity um, is certainly better for your thread. And I think it's the same for backing. I think backing is a little more um, durable than thread when it comes to the heat and the humidity. Um, so I, the more important thing I think is to keep it away from dust and lint. So, you know, some, you know, like if you're at a, a shipping area, you, you create a lot of dust um, in the air. So if that's true in your area, then you might want to be putting those in packages, keeping them in the plastic and things like that, because you don't want to introduce dust to the machine. You know, it's going to start getting into the, the rotary hook area, um, and then you're just going to run into all kinds of issues. So that makes sense. And again, like the higher the humidity, um, the more moisture in the air and the more it can kind of sit in the backing. Um, right yeah yep okay and then like you said we so we um as far as the the tear away we have that one ounce one and a half ounce one and a uh, point eight and then we have the two ounce um yep so only available in the soft tear away um the two ounce a little bit heavier um these were formerly considered a wash away um, backing, but I took away the word wash away because they don't wash away like your cutaway washaways. You don't just put them in water and they dissipate. What happens is when I talked about the tearing away and there's a little bit of fuzziness around the edges. So say if it's the back of a towel and you tear it away, 
you might see a little bit of white fuzziness. That's what will wash away eventually. Because like I said, all tearaways wash away. And and as far as these tearaways, I see that everything just comes in white other than the one and a half crisp. Um, which again, I would it, it makes sense. I mean, y your tearaway, it's primarily being torn away anyway. So how much can really be seen um, right. from it? So that makes sense. A lot of sentence sure um and then again we have the easy cap stabilizer um i have the two and a half ounce here or actually no this is three ounce um yeah. i mean it's it's not not light um and the the cap stabilizer they are typically cut specifically the side it's not typically a square we, we want it to go across um the hat and then again if you go with a larger one uh, or, or wider, you're going to be able to um, do kind of a 270 without having to swap the backing. Is that right, right. Nancy? That's correct. Yeah. Um, so two and a half and three ounces is what's available in a, in a cap tearaway because you do need those heavy, heavier tearaways to fill up the gap in their hats as you're um, and helping to get that material nice and flat. Um, so it's the same thing with your lightweight, medium, and heavy tearaway. The crisp ones, you know, maybe your two and a half ounce you can use on your lighter, more flexible hats, maybe three ounce on your heavier designs and things like that. Um, some people like the two and a half. Certainly adding two pieces, you get in five ounces, not bad for a cap. And the same thing with two, two layers of the three ounce. Um, the third um, cap with the Supreme in it that's going to come up next is the, um, this one tears easily. So it's more like a soft tear away um, in that heavy weight. So this one provides the least amount of stress on the, the design and the fabric. Um, but they're all great for caps. Like you said, they, they're anywhere from, I've seen them down to three and three quarter inch wide. Ours are four and four and a half inch wide. Um, so that they fit right into the, your cap frames. Is it fair to say like Supreme or the softer backing often costs more than maybe the just right? Um, yeah. It, yes. it, so that yeah. is fair to say. So relative. Yeah, they're, they're not hugely more expensive. Certainly, certainly not when it's by piece. Um, and even, you know, two and a half pack, two and a half piece pack is not like extremely more, but yeah. Definitely. Otherwise, why would we give it that name, right? <laughs> marketing purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, my marketing is showing. So Easy Cut Performance, 2.7 ounce. So, okay, so that starts at 2.7 ounces, right? Yep. Um, so now we're, we're moving into more of the specialty backing. So they're not going to have different weights to them. Um, they're specialty because they're, they're available for specific reasons. You know, so if it's not covered by your basic cutaways, your basic tearaways or the washaways, you know, they, they mostly have a specific reason for being. And it, it, a lot of the times performance wear, ultra stretchy garments, um, and it's a woven backing, right? The, the, the easy cut performance. Yeah. And then the Weblon no show, which you just mentioned a little bit ago, which is 1.5 ounce, or at least the initial, mm -hmm. uh, again, performance wear, ultra stretchy, um, used on ultra thin or, or is, is the backing itself ultra thin? Um, it is. Which, yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, um so yeah so, go ahead so these are both performance backings and it directly correlates to the performance wear garments out there um ironically i find that these backings they're not replacing your basic cutaways but they have so much stability to them and because we're talking about a web line, which is a non-woven and a the performance wear that's a woven, that's why you're seeing a huge difference in the ounces there because one's more like a fabric and one's yeah. a non-woven, right? 
um, but they're both super thin, so they're not adding any bulk behind the performance wear garments. Um, but they're also both great for your lightweight dress shirts. <clears throat> um, and this is the one that I very often will throw that lightweight or medium weight tearaway on the very bottom. It's kind of my go-to recipe for a lot of designs. It's not until I get to um, like maybe, you know, your heavier fleece, your heavier sweatshirts that I would go away from these backings, but I do show. Um, so the performance wear, is that on your left or your right? This is your performance. And like you said, yeah. it does really feel like um, fabric. Um, it does. It feels like it could be a dress shirt, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what it has in it is it has a little bit of a starch-like product in it that goes away once it's been washed. But that starch gives it a little bit of stiffness. And you might say, well, why would I put this behind my shirt? what that starch does is it helps you during the embroidery process so it grabs the hoop very well holds the garment nice and flat for you and still while you're embroidering you cut away the excess and even though there's um because it's woven it's going to fray a little bit once it gets to the design the edge of the design it's going to stop fraying and it's super soft on the back side same thing is true with the weblon no show and you might say well why do we have two Again, it comes to the embroiderer and what they prefer. Some prefer that woven performance, others prefer the Weblon no-show. Um, often in the industry, the Weblon no-show is referred to as a poly mesh product. Um, we have a different poly mesh here, um, but this one is a no-show. It's embossed. Um, so the one you're showing now is the poly mesh, and that is another real lightweight woven. I think it's one and a half ounce. Um, can be used for this similar thing. That's really a more, um, I think, concentrated per customer um, that would use a product like that. Um, if you can show the Weblon again, that one has the embossed look to it. It's available in black and white, as is the performance as well. Um, so this one has that embossed kind of pattern to it. It's very common um, that you can see. In it that looks product. just like the the image, you know, one of the images we showed earlier. You can see how it's constructed. Um, yeah, and and you know what we like to use the Weblon No Show um, because if we're on a thinner uh, piece of material, you don't want to see again that kind of that backing sharp edge. Um, yeah, and it really is. I mean, the name's in it. It's a No Show. You you don't see it. But it is amazing, this poly mesh, it, I feel like I am holding up a uh, silk screen. I mean, it yeah. is just yes. like screen print mesh. Um, it's like the old sheer curtains. It's very similar to that. Has to be a little bit more expensive. Um, the, so these performance wear backings are definitely, um, you know, more expensive than your basic cutaways. Um, I do like to say that even though the Weblon No Show is a one and a half ounce, I easily use two layers of this and put that lightweight tear away on the bottom because it's so thin. But even one piece of Weblon, as you pull on that, Zach, you're going to see, you're not going to tear that. It, it's just simply not going to tear. You might stretch it a little bit. Wow. Um, is that the Weblon? Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. I mean, well, it's like it gives, it gives the stability of like a basic three ounce backing. So wow. you can put, you know, you can easily put seven, 8,000 stitches on that. Um, maybe if you double it, if you're going to be doing something higher, higher stitch for that, but, um, you know, your basic left chest logos, it's going to handle it. Great. Either See, one. When you're using these specialties, you can kind of, I don't want to say throw out the weight situation, but you think about it like that 1.5 ounce, um, cutaway versus that 1.5 ounce web lawn. I mean, very different. Um, yeah you know, strength. And uh, again, like you just said, good idea to double and add a layer of lightweight tear away, which is what we actually do in our shop. Okay. Um, so the extra stable 2.5 ounce um, cut away with an embedded grid. I'm trying to find my sample of this. So I think it's in the specialty section. Yep. So, okay. Now you're really talking about a grid, Nancy. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. 
Wow. Um, yeah, so there's actually two layers of backing with that grid is sandwiched in the middle of the two. And what that grid does, so now we have a two and a half ounce cutaway, like our basic, um, with that extra grid in there, that thing is super stable. Uh, a lot of people love this for that stable, um, sta extra stability. Um, but as you can feel it, it's not super thick. No, and you can't, yeah, it's like the web lawn, it's hard to tear at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, versus the easy tear stick on, or that, actually go back, the 2.5 ounce does come in a white and a black. Um, yeah. versus actually, I'm going to take that back. The black's no longer available. It's going away. That guy. <laughs> Just want to point um, it out in case people are looking for it. And then we have the easy stick on 1.5 ounce. So is this like the other one where it's uh, two layers, one with paper essentially that we pull away? Yes. Yeah. So once you pull the paper away, you have a pressure sensitive adhesive. I mean, uh, you know, harder you press it down on the fabric or the fabric on it, um, the better it works. And this one's a tear away. The one we talked about before was a cutaway. And this guy's great for your hard to hoop items. Um, so if you wanted to embroider on the collar of a dress shirt, the cuff of a dress shirt, maybe the, your sleeve on your shirt, you can actually hoop this with the paper side up, remove the paper, and then now you have a hoop that's filled with all the adhesive. And you can press anything onto that, um, whether it's a dog collar, um, the collar, the cuff, uh, things like that. If you've ever heard of fast frames, fast frames are like a window frame that don't have a top or a bottom. It's just one big frame. That's what they use this adhesive for. So they peel the paper off a large piece, slap it up there. Now you might have a 12 inch by 12 inch area of adhesive. You could line up 10 dog collars on the same hoop, embroider them all and wow. move along. Okay, so, so you brought up a great point there. So, um... If we're using a stick on, um, we can often get away with doing multiple designs um, or, or you know multiple pieces at once. I, I'd assume this would be more maybe in a patch or emblem. I don't I don't know how often you do the other type, but you know when I hoop, we always try to get the back. We want the backing to go all the way, essentially past the frame, yeah. right? Um, yep. Versus a stick on. Um, is it still the same mentality where I really want it to go all the way across or would it be the end of the world if I used less and it just stuck in the middle and it didn't go to the very edge, right? But what's the logic there? Um, so if you're hooping the material, the, the stick on, you want it to go beyond the hoop okay. so that it's snug, right? Um, sometimes, so another way to use it, say if you want to embroider on the edge of a curtain, you can actually, before you hoop it, remove the paper, put the curtain on the material, cover the rest of the adhesive with the extra paper, then you can hoop it, and you can embroider right on the edge of something. Because you know when you hoop something, you want it to, you really should be hooping the whole material. Yes. But now you're hooping it on the stick on, which is holding it in place. So I've done a curtain that way. I've done a cuff that way. Um, so you answered my question perfectly, that the... Uh, backing should always cover the whole frame, but the material optimally should do the same thing, but it's not always possible. It would be less of a problem if the material stopped, you know, halfway through it. Is, is yes. that a sense of interesting? Okay. Yep. Because the adhesive is holding it in place now, right? So it's a tear away. So now we have to say, what can I embroider on this, right? If it's a dog collar, a horse halter, a very heavy mesh material a tearaway is fine, right? If you're embroidering on a cuff or a collar of a shirt, that has a, a backing or an interfacing inside of it. So mm -hmm. it's okay to use the tearaway on that. I'm not going to use it on my left chest of the logo of my dress shirt because I need backing back there, right? Um, so you are you got to make sure whatever you're embroidering this on, it can support the design because now it's a tearaway. I mean, makes sense. And and now we're on to the waffle, which somehow I didn't know, hey, is it a tearaway or a cutaway? But, <laughs> but you can see that is a very clean cut and you can hear it. I mean, it's kind of gratifying. Yes. Um, another name for this product that people may be more familiar with is pop away. 
Um, so if you do it real slow, it like pop, pop, pop. Um, so that's why they call it a pop, pop away. Um, this is a very lightweight, even though it's one and a half ounce, it's a very lightweight tear away, um, very minimal stability after the fact. But as you can see how easily it tears away, I like to use this or recommend this for your light, open airy designs that you don't want to be pulling on when you tear it away. Um, or maybe it's a fabric, you know, maybe it's silk, maybe it's satin and it's real flimsy materials. So your lightweight designs or delicate designs and delicate fabrics because there's little to no stress when you pull it away. I mean, it's amazing as you look at these different types of backing, how different they look as far as the way they were woven together. Um, or non-woven as the case non may be. <laughs> uh so like you said delicate designs and fabrics for that waffle just right um and then the weblon mesh 1.6 ounce um and melting point of 450 to 460 so when am i using the weblon um mesh no show um, so if this is going to be, so if you're embroidering on a garment that's going to be subjected to some higher heats <clears throat> um, out in the industries, um, this is a great fabric um, stabilizer to use. Can you give us an example of? Um, so it's not rated for fire resistant, um, but the heat, um, the heat that it's subjected to would be equal to like what you would use on something that's, you know, maybe an oven mitt, something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Oven mitt. Um, if you could use it on, um, safety gear that might be subjected to high heat, you know, if it doesn't require the certification, the certification. Yeah. yeah. It, it is easier to kind of pull apart, um, that wet web lawn mesh. Um, but it's not a tear away, right? It's, is it? A no, that is a cutaway. Yep. Um, Very similar to the Weblon No Show, just thicker and fluffier. Right. Okay. Now, so we've talked about the cutaway, talked about the tearaway. The, those are kind of the go-to. I mean, your most common items: uh, hats, <laughs> um, polos, quarter zips, button downs, and then we have the heat away uh for a lot of the patches badges emblems so um the badge master but tell us a little bit about the badge master that madeira sells um so i like to say badge master is just like easy aqua supreme on steroids um it's 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 three mil but it's 80 microns um so weblon i'm sorry easy aqua supreme is 20 Badge Master is 80 or three mil thick. Um, so it's a much thicker water soluble topping, which can be embroidered directly onto. If you're using, you could create emblems on these badges, patches, um, or you can do the freestanding lace on this. So this is just more of a branded product that's in the industry that we have on hand for the people that specifically want um, the Badge Master brand. Okay. And then, the easy badge film 100 micron. Um, so it's heat activated, again, often used with emblems. Um, what, again, can you a little bit explain badge master? Yeah, badge? absolutely. So we touched a little bit on this up in the earlier slides. Um, so we have the two, two heat away films. This is the thicker of the two. You can create your badges and patches directly on this in two different ways. Um, any shape or size, you know, we talked about, you know, if I'm going to use all thread, then I'm going to embroider it um, with the satin stitch on the very end, two layers of this 100 microns, and now you're embroidering on 200 microns thick. Um, and it creates a great foundation to create those emblems. Um, they perforate off the off the outside of those satin stitches. And if there's any little pieces, so maybe you have a, in your design, there's a hole in the middle, maybe it's a keyhole um, that you want it to be removed, that can be removed with heat. 
and any little edges on the outside can be removed with heat. So it's a very efficient way to make a patch or an emblem. Or I should mention as well, um, so if, say you want to use um, blank twill pieces that have been cut specific, you can use this material to embroider on with an applique um, technique using that twill. So an applique technique is when you have a placement stitch that you can put that, you can match up where the blank twill goes, and then you can let the machine run and finish the whole design. And again, satin stitch on the outside. Um, the nice thing with a lot of your digitizing um, software, um, the few that I've seen, you have a mock um, marrow stitch that you can put on the outside so it'll look like you did it on a marrow machine, um, but it's a, on, done on your embroider machine. So, digitizing <laughs> software has come a long way. Um, yeah, it sure has. Uh, and then the lightweight 30 micron um, about a third of the the weight as the badge film, right? Yes, absolutely. So this one, you can use it as a topping or a backing. Um, you would compare this to the Easy Aqua Supreme. You put it on, on the top of fluffy material to keep the stitches nice and flat so that you can see them. They don't sink down into the fluff. But maybe this is a garment or fabric that you don't want to put water on, but you can apply a little heat with. So most of it will perforate off and you can tear it away. Any remaining pieces that you need to get rid, rid of, you can use a heat gun um, to just apply a little heat. Um, it takes a little practice to figure out what the you know great, best heat is, how far away you want to be, but it's going to take that material and shrink it up into little balls and you can brush it away. So it could be a topping or a backing for a lightweight material. I have We have a very high-end... Um, embroiderer that does um, upholstery and home decor. And they love this fabric because you don't want to be seeing any backing, top or bottom. Makes sense. Um, so the Easy Heat Seal Nylon 5 mil. It's a two-sided adhesive, right? Yep. Um, no. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. One, two, um, so these are the two. Um, so heat away. These are heat away. These are heat applied as opposed to heat away. Um, so these are heat seals. And this is what you use on the back of your patch or emblem. Um, you apply this after the fact or before the marrow um, stitching. And this becomes your adhesive. So you can apply it. First, you apply it to the back of the emblem. And then you can apply it to a hat, a bag, a jacket. Um, or anything else that you want to heat apply it to. Um, so these come, one's a nylon, one's a polyester. And the difference between these two is simply the material that it's made of, but also what it adheres to. So if you're doing more of specialty products like wool, um, acetate, and there's some polyester in there as well, you use one and the other one's more for your poly cotton and blend. Um, so you pick it based on what you're applying it to. Okay, makes sense. Don't don't assume nylon goes on nylon, poly goes on poly, right? <laughs> exactly, yep. Um, and lastly, we have the laminate. A laminate, so the two heat seals are two-sided adhesives, <clears throat> meaning you can apply it to the back of the patch and then to a garment. Second, the laminate has one side of adhesive. And this simply finishes the backside of a badge or an emblem. Um, you can apply the heat seals after the fact um, on this one. And another thing that you can do with this one is if you're embroidering on weather resistant garments, say you're embroidering on an umbrella, you can apply this laminate to the back side and it seals the material up. So all the perforations you're making in embroidery allows the water to come through, put this on the back and now the water won't seep through. Cool trick. And then, oh, no. I don't even want to try to pronounce that incorrectly. Crinoline, crinoline. Um, very popular back in the 50s. This is what they wore under the, the, the skirts to make them stick out. Um, so when it comes to embroidery, it's, it's the stiffness that you can add inside your hoop. Maybe you're putting this in there 
before you embroider, I'm sorry, after you embroider, but before you do the heat, excuse me, after you do the heat seal, um, and it's a very stiff material. So sometimes you like your badges to be very badgy, very stiff. It's not going to, you know, like I think the municipal ones that go on the very heavy duty uniforms, that thing's not bending at all, right? It's staying. Um, so maybe you want that kind of a badge. Um, you can add the crinoline in between to give it a more, give it more stiffness. Okay. Um, Aqua Supreme, I think we kind of talked a little bit about this um, earlier. Um, it's water soluble. Uh, it, it can be used as, I mean, is the Aqua Supreme just a topping or can we use it as a backing as well? It's really too thin for a backing. Um, or to be embroidering directly on. So you would go to your badge master if you wanted to embroider directly on it. This is um, your topping that you're going to use on a regular basis, whether you're using that thin thread or if you're embroidering on the um, fleece or ter terry towels and things like that. Um, back at the beginning, we had that pink fleece that we had the flowers side by side um, and showed how one looks way better than the other one um, simply by adding that topping on. Um, so you think about your stitches, your, your running stitches, your decorative stitches, those really do sink down in the fluffy, fluffy materials. So you want to use that and, topping. Okay. And, and it's, um, you said store it in a, um, keep it in its bag, but we don't want to get a lot of humidity to it because then it will start dissolving or, or <laughs> Right? Like yeah, and it actually dries up and gets really crispy. You can still use it if it dries up a little bit, um, but it's it's better to be more malleable so that you can lay it on or hoop it. What What's a good uh, humidity? You know, 40, 50 percent, 30, 50. Is that fair? I really don't know. That's, that's a question <laughs> I've never been too asked. technical. Um, I mean, if you're sweating, it's probably too humid. You know? <laughs> and and um, like... So yes, just keep it in a bag, um, a Ziploc bag. Some of them come right in a Ziploc bag. Definitely put it in there. Um, if you're using rolls, get a larger bag. You know, if the one that it came in is not reusable, um, yeah, just keep it in plastic. Um, and it just, you know, then it doesn't matter how hot, hot it, or how much humidity is in the office. Still amazing to me that they're both <laughs> 250. Um, Believe it or not. Uh, all right. Uh, easy 3D foam. So if we're going to be doing puff embroidery, essentially we're going to do a layer of foam. Technically it's, I mean, would you call it a topping technically? Cause it's going on the top. Sure. Or... Yeah, absolutely. I would call this a topping. Um, so this is laid down before it kind of like an applique where you would have a placement line. You put the um, piece of uh, foam on top, maybe use spray adhesive, maybe use tape to hold it down um, until it starts tacking it down. And special digitizing is done um, because what you need is you need wide satin stitches and you need a lot of density to fill it in so it covers the foam. Um, there's caps that go on the end of the letters in the digitizing that keeps it from poking out of the side. Um, and there's, I forget the other word, um, when you're, you have two parts of the letters going together, um, you kind of overlap there. So digitizing is very important when it comes to 3D um, embroidery, also called raised embroidery. Um, but the 3D, uh, the three millimeter um, foam is what's more popular. We have two different ones. Um, the bodybuilder is a more firm, which is going to give you that kind of square edge rise where the other ones with the colors gives a little bit more of a rounded edge. So they're both great. They both look good. Um, it just depends on what you're looking to perform. You can easily double the layers on these and you can get quite a bit of difference. So it's okay to use two layers, get a little more higher. Definition. Do you, um, now you typically would not ever use like, because I mean, Aqua Supreme, um, is often for you know more detailed foam is not made for detail really right um but maybe a design does have detail and then one part of it is foam so do you often see um you know this is added in the middle of sewing a design uh because at the beginning we might do the detail and then we do the foam at the end is that fair 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you could have a whole embroidered design where just pieces of it are, are raised um, to add the interest to the overall design for sure. Um, so in the digitizing of the whole and uh, the entire design, kind of like an applique is you schedule in those stops so yep. that you can both apply, um, put the 3D foam in there um, and also to remove it if you need to add designs. Slow the machine down, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, definitely. And a sharp, a sharp needle is great for that. Very sharp. Okay, sharp needle when we do 3D. Yeah, you want you want that nice perforation so you can pull it away. What is a backing finisher? Um, so just like it sounds, it's a finisher. So this is not used for stabilizing. These are used to finish off the backside of a design on the inside of the garment. So you're adding this after the embroidery has been done. And we have a couple different options here. Um, so if you think of, or if you have babies in the house, infants, and they have their little sleepers or almost anything, it's so common to have just little, little tiny embroidered designs on their garments. If you look at the back side of that, you're going to see a piece of white material that's covering it. And if you feel it, it's nice and smooth and silky. Um, that product is the easy comfort just right. This is a backing finisher only. It's not used for stabilizing and it's available in white and you're probably not going to find that zach because it's typically okay. not in the embroidery book because of its kind of makeup it's very flimsy um and um but this is what you you what you do is you do your embroidery you turn your garment inside out you lay this with the bumpy side down because that's your adhesive you trace around the design with a pen and then you trim that shape out lay it on the back of the um the garment that's been embroidered on the design use your heat press or iron to apply it and it's gonna stay on the back side and be nice and smooth against the skin so it finishes off the back side so it's great for infant okay. children's wear um, or anybody with sensitive skin or maybe you want to uh, try to be a little bit more of a high-end um, shop this is something that you can offer as an upsell so you won't see the stitching uh, that's right yep and it feels and you don't feel so uh, another thing is so say maybe you're embroidering with metallic threads those can be a little scratchy you know if there's any okay. sticking on the back side so you could add this to, to eliminate that issue the second one that's here um, is the weblon no show fusible this one does the same exact thing it's available in black and white but this is a Weblon no-show product with a, a heat activated adhesive on one side. So you can use it both as a backing finisher or you could use it as a fusible stabilizer. Okay. That's a lot of different types of backing. Um, and that's why Madeira, again, in addition to these uh, samples, I found the Madeira Easy Guide backing and topping to be very well organized um it, it's essentially everything we talked about is covered in this pamphlet um and where we stole a lot of our uh images that we showed at the very beginning um it it, it, it has its own little learning curve right um and i i know that it, again attending the trade show like next month is the long beach show there's no show like that and at shows, there's um, typically uh, seminars and there's professional embroiderers who've been doing it for decades, like Eric Campbell, um, who provide a lot of great insight into, um, you know, the tips when it comes to digitizing, again, backing, thread, um, the whole nine yards. Um, again, uh, and we're, you know, I hope to have you back, uh, Nancy, and we can talk more about the other variables such as you know thread there's not just one way to thread um that that should be used for uh, every design um you know just backing is just backing and topping is just one thing to get right it is a big part of it um and you, you having that variety on hand to be able to select the right type um when you do a job and and when it comes to embroidery uh at our shop we always do a test sew before we um, uh, start going, you know, at the fabric. It, the, the products are more expensive typically when you sew them. I mean, again, a polo costs more than a t-shirt, so does a jacket or a coat. Um, and you, you, we, whenever you do a test sew, 
it's a good idea to be doing it on a very similar material. Otherwise, all you're really doing is confirming colors. You want to also confirm that the digitizing is good and we're going to be using the right vacuum. Um, Absolutely. I like to say, don't throw out those mistakes. You keep them because those are your test fabric. So um, mistakes happen, um, but the good news is you can use it as a um, test stitch out later on. Absolutely. All right, Nancy, um, we've been going at, at it a lot longer than I even realized. Um, that's what happens when you have fun. Uh, <laughs> let's see if we have any questions. Uh, okay. Is two pieces of 2.5 ounce cutaway backing too much for most left chest logos? I would say yes, because, you know, a two, so what is a a left chest logo, you know. Um, our Madeira logo is probably about 4,000 stitches. That's a real small logo. I certainly wouldn't need five ounces of backing on that. My two and a half ounce is gonna work just fine. Um, so I would consider if there's not too many stitches in that left chest logo, which most times there's not, um, a two and a half ounce should suffice. So now you're going to look at a different variable and maybe it's the digitizing that needs to be adjusted. And keep in, keep in mind, um, digitizing, you know, if you have a design, you should have multiple examples of that design because if you're embroidering on performance wear, if you're embroidering on a dress shirt or a t-shirt, that design should be a little bit adjusted to a, account for that. Oh, and also a cap, you know, a cap, embroiders from the center out. So, you know, you need to have that design as well. Um, so when you're getting, when you're digitizing or you're having somebody digitize, make sure that it's digitized for the fabric you're going to embroider it on. Not just flat versus uh, round, you know, a hat, but actually the material mm -hmm. that it's going to be sewn on um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, another question we have is what, what type of, um, support does Madeira have? Are there, is there a YouTube channel that, that covers some of the same? I mean, we're going to be uploading this video to YouTube, so hopefully it is helpful, but um, does Madeira have other help uh, videos or information outside of their guides? We do. Um, so servicing our customers by helping them be the best that they can is key here at Madeira. Um, we want to supply you the products, of course, um, but we definitely have a YouTube. We have um, all the social media as well. And it's all interactive um, to get to one or the other. We'll certainly be linking over to this one as well. Um, but yes, um, and I think even just as important is our customer service and sales department that we have here. Um, educating internally um, is, is a, an important part of what we do um, so that when you call up and speak to somebody, um, they're going to be able to answer your questions as well. And if they can answer it, there's usually somebody else that can. And I'm always available um, to take calls as well for some, um, if, you, if you need enhanced, you know, help um, to help you with questions. So it's very key here at Madeira USA to help. And shops, shops can purchase directly from Madeira's website in addition to going to a dealer, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So we're Madeira USA. Um, MadeiraUSA.com is our website. You can order directly, you know, obviously 24 seven there. We have live chat there to help you um, during the day. Um, and um, so, yes, you, or you can call our 1-800 number. Awesome. 1-800-225-3001. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready to make an infomercial. <laughs> I am. But, uh, hey, you got yeah. the easy catchphrase too. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I think that's all our questions, Nancy. Again, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, again, I, I've had hundreds of conversations with shop owners. I can confidently say that 80 to 90% of the thread that is used in a shop is Madeira branded thread and backing. Um, it's just by far the most popular and I've talked, I talked to a lot of shops in, uh, the U S Canada, UK, Australia, it, it's all the same. Uh, everybody loves Madeira. Um, 
I don't know of another consumable supplier for any decoration process that has such a large portion of the market. Um, and it's clear why um, everybody loves working with Madeira. Um, thank you again so much, Nancy, for your time today. And hopefully we can do uh, another episode in the future and keep educating the shops on uh, the different variables that, that go into embroidery and how to kind of uh, get into embroidery if, if you're coming from the print world and uh, want to start offering it because it's very different than, than any printing decoration process. Um, customers always, they, they don't understand what's the difference between DTG, DTF, screen printing. But when you tell them it's printing versus embroidery, they know exactly what that means. And um, that's why it's always a great uh, idea to have it in your shop or be able to outsource it to another shop who does it well. Um, because you, you want to act as that one-stop shop and the less times you have to tell your customer no, the better. And um, Madeira makes the embroidery uh, easier um, or, or helps uh, you reach your potential in getting the best quality um, because it doesn't matter how skilled you are, how great your machine is. If you don't have the right consumables and you're not using them correctly, you're never going to get those uh, great results. And Madeira has the wide range of products. And again, the knowledge um, and, and input to uh, help you reach your potential. Thank you again, Nancy. And um, hopefully again, we'll see you in a future episode. Thank you so much, Zach. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to working with you again. Thanks. Have a good one, guys.